This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. talk about today is our Lord Jesus Christ, that He is one of us for all of us. The start today is a jumping off point in the book of Job. Job, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 32. But one of the thoughts that Job uh, relays here, as we're going to read, is one of how I wish I had a help. How I wish I had a mediator. How I wish I had a go-between. Someone to intercede uh, for me uh, between myself and, and God. And this is what he says in Job 9, beginning in verse 32. He says, He's not a man. God is not a man like me, that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. He's basically, what is he saying here? He's saying, you know, God's so much greater than I am. He's so much bigger than I am. We're not equals here. You know, between me and God, it's not a fair fight, is it? So he says, here I am, we're, we're trying to intercede, we're trying to have a relationship here between God who is so mighty and so great and me who am nothing, Job is saying. Job was a very humble man, was he not? He says, oh, he's not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. And this is his lament, his desire, his, his, his wish, right? Job's wish. If, there were, if only there were someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both. What is Job saying here? I wish there were someone here between us to, to bridge this gap of relationship between, between me and, and, and the Almighty, if there were only someone. Well, there really wasn't anyone, was there? Not in Job's day. And yet God was faithful. God was kind to Job, and ultimately we know that there is a very happy ending to the book of Job. Well, interestingly enough, I believe that indeed this is a, quite a, a profound foreshadowing of what does take place in the New Covenant. Job lived in, in, in the Old Covenant, Old Testament days, and yet he is his lament, his desire, his wish, actually becomes fulfilled in the New Covenant in God's greatest gift. We know that Paul says in Galatians the fourth chapter in verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, whose time? God's time. In other words, on God's time. When God, it wasn't, it wasn't right in Job's day. Now who's to say it wasn't right in Job's day? Well, God. It wasn't God's time yet. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, and born under the law. The Virgin Mary conceived, correct? She conceived by the Holy Spirit, overshadowing her, coming upon her. And so the child to be born, according to the angel, would be called the Son of the Highest. So the Son is born of Mary, and Luke goes on to tell, tell us that as Jesus grew, he increased in wisdom and in stature. And I, I think it's interesting talking about laying one hand upon us both. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Interesting. So even as he's growing up, Luke seems to be able to capture the idea that he's growing in being this go-between, this bridge. He's, he's increasing in his wisdom. He's increasing in, in stature. I think that, 
that would mean both his height but also his character. He's, he's increasing in these things. He's growing up. Jesus becomes a bringer of hope. Let's look at this. This is in Matthew, the ninth chapter. You remember this story. But it's very profound when you begin to think about the ramifications of having someone, one of us, between us and God. So, and behold, and they brought to him, that is, they brought to Jesus, a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven. And it's very powerful, isn't it? that Jesus tells this man, your sins are forgiven. But I don't want us to overlook the first thing he says. What is the first thing he says? Before he says your sins are forgiven, he says to him, be of good cheer. Take courage, right? How beautiful is that? Jesus was a very encouraging, is a very encouraging comforter. And Jesus did see them for what they were. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why for, wherefore, do you think evil in your hearts? For what is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and walk? And what it will clarify here is, by what authority or by what power he does do these things. And he does. But that ye may know, that who? Remember, the title of the lesson is One of Us for All of Us. The Son of who? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. Actually, in the Scriptures, do you know that Jesus, mostly in reference to Himself, refers to Himself more often as the Son of Man than He is referred to as the Son of God. Is He, is the, is he the Son of God? Absolutely He is. But when Jesus chooses to reference most often Himself, He'll say, the Son of Man, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So that you'll know this, you scribes that are worried about uh, you know, the, the technicalities of the matter, if you're worried about these things, then know this, I have authority. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. So then he turns to the sick of the palsy. Arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. And he arose, and he departed unto his house. So who is this man? He's a man that brings forgiveness. He's a man who has authority from God. I want you to look and realize something. What is it that in this event, did the crowd, did the people that witnessed the event, what did they go away from this event having understood? What did this event teach them? What did this healing of this man, also this interchange, and what Jesus said, what did they come away from this event believing, understanding? It's very important. What they came away from is this. When the multitude saw it, they were afraid and glorified God who had given such authority under men, unto men. What did the crowds go away understanding? The Son of Man has authority. God has given authority. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Pretty momentous day, right? He's a man over judgment. In John the 5th chapter, The Father has life in Himself, so hath He given to the Son to have life in Himself, and hath given Him authority to execute judgment also, because... What's the word because mean? Why do we use the word because? It means one thing predicated upon another. One thing has to do with the other. These things, these are linked concepts here. That's why we use the term because. Because he is the son of man. Who's our ultimate judge? God is our judge can give to Jesus authority to execute judgment. Can he not? And that's what Jesus is saying. The Father has given the Son to have life in himself, and the Father has given the Son authority to execute judgment. And that could be the end of the verse. We could say amen to that. Let it be so. And yet, 
Jesus tells us the because. And the because is very important. We don't often think about this, but it's very, very important. The reason that God has given the Son the authority to execute judgment is because the Son is the Son of Man. And that begins to open up for us and unlock for us some of the reasons why He must be one of us. Again, it's kind of like us in Job. We're trying to evaluate this relationship between, you know, Job's trying to evaluate this, this dealings, this interrelationship between himself and God. And he's saying, basically he's saying what? Compared to, to, to God, I am nothing. I just wish there was someone here that could bridge this gap. God did provide the bridge. What kind of bridge did he build? Jesus said, the Father gave the Son to have life in himself. Jesus also said the Father gave to the Son to execute judgment. We as imperfect mankind, are we liable to judgment? Yes, we are. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the Father has given unto the Son the authority to execute judgment. Why? Because He is the Son of Man. The Son of Man. So one of us, then, the Son of Man will be our judge. The Father has given the Son to have life in Himself. The Father has given the Son the authority to execute judgment. Not because He thinks the Son is going to be real angry, but because the Son, Jesus, is the Son of Man. Let me ask you a question. When you're talking about dealing between us, uh, us and God, you're talking about judgment. All of us will stand one day. And you will talk about judgment. When we stand before God, having nothing to offer, being nothing, being weak, being broken, being bruised, the one sitting upon the judgment seat, we talk about the judgment seat. Scripture's talk about it. That's why we talk about it. Who would you like to have sitting on the judgment seat? Would you like to have a super, again, going back to this first, you know, just for example, would you like to have an angelic being who is not subject to the same temptations and trials and struggles that you and I are? I mean, maybe this being could have, could have we could even, we could, you know, God could make a being that could have struggles and temptations, but they wouldn't be ours. Unless he's one of us. So God creates a, a being and, and, and this being is going to stand up there and, and, and judge us. By what standard would he judge us? You would think it'd be a different standard, would you not? But if Jesus is the Son of Man, if Jesus is one of us, as the Scriptures teach that he is, and we're not talking about just technicalities today, we're talking about relevance today. If Jesus is one of us, then we know then the one who is going to execute judgment is going to understand us, is he not? That's a story of great hope. This is not about working out technicalities. This is a story about unlocking hope. The one who said to this boy, <laughs> excuse me, boy, this man sick of the palsy, son, be of good cheer. Is the same one that the Father has given authority to execute judgment. Is that good news? I think that's fantastic news. If that's the kind of judge, you know, there's different ones. You ever heard of that? You ever go, you know, you go to a, <laughs> you know, Lord forbid, nobody's ever ever had any any kind any kind of problem. But maybe, maybe like me, you've had a speeding ticket. There are certain places that you don't want to go to court with your speeding ticket because they are the proverbial hanging judge. Now, I don't think we really hang folks for, for speeding. I'm not going to get into all that. But the idea is what? It's important who you, go, who you go before, right? You know, there are certain places. I won't tell you where they are. Because, <laughs> but there are certain places around here. I'm not going to speed because I know who handles the ticketing judging. 
It gives me, you know, it gives me good influence to the. But <laughs> think about this though. That's a silly example, but think about it re in real life. We know that we are subject to judgment, are we not? Who do you want to stand before you, stand with you before Almighty, perfect God? Who do you want standing there on your behalf? Who do you want there that to lay His hand upon you both and bring you together? I want the one who said to the man that was sick of the palsy, who did have sins that needed to be forgiven, I want the one that the first words out of his mouth to that man were, Son, be of good cheer. That's who I want as my judge. And praise God, that's who He gave me. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. He's the Son of Man. He's the Son of Man. So, He's a man over judgment. He is a man bringing resurrection in 1 Corinthians verse 15 and 21. We know that there's a man that brought death. Who was that? Who was the man that brought death? Adam brought death. But there's also another man who brings resurrection. How about that? Is that good news? Again, this is not technicalities. This is about good news. It's good to know. Job, one day in the kingdom, I believe, but Job, if he were here with us today, he would be dancing the proverbial jig, forgive me, because what he only could wish for in his day when he was going through his struggles and his trials is here in Jesus Christ. By man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. By who? By man. By man. By man came resurrection of the dead. A man brings grace in Romans the 5th chapter and verse 15. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man. Again, who are we referring to? This is Paul writing in both places. Now to the Romans, he's saying that one man, the trespass of one man, caused many to die. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Paul is just extolling this, isn't he? He's saying, oh yes, what Adam brought was terrible and had such great and far-reaching consequences. Look at what Jesus Christ has brought. Look at what Jesus Christ has done. By one man, death entered in the world. By one man, Jesus Christ, righteousness, resurrection, life, Judgment, but judgment by one who is called the Son of Man. All of these things are available to us. These aren't technicalities. These are great and wonderful things to celebrate. The one man Jesus Christ brought to many. Verse 17. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? God has given a gift here. He could have done it any way He wanted to. But it's not just a technicality. It's important that God chose to do what He did, how He did it. He chose that there would be one of us for all of us. God chose that. The gift of God. God's abundant provision. Think about that. What do you make provision for? We're talking about making provision. It's about your planning, aren't you? You're planning and preparing. God had a plan and a preparation of grace and He brought it to bear. The gift is given through the one man, Jesus Christ. Powerful, isn't it? So, to summarize, this is all by man. Forgiveness of sins, given by a man. Judgment. We think about judgment always in a, in a harsh context, but think about this. When the judge is one of us, that's good. Judgment by a man. Resurrection by a man. God's grace by a man. And finally, life 
by a man. All of these things, we just read the scriptures, did we not? All of these things are by man. Specifically, the man Christ Jesus. How wonderful is that? So I told you last week, I referred to it last week about what I've come to call the five magic words. The five magic words. He had to be God. It's what usually is said. He had to be God. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus is the He. He had to be God. He had to be God to forgive sins. Well, verse we just read, the verses we just read, actually don't really go that way, do they? We're talking about God giving the authority unto men. That's what they understood when they left. The multitude said they glorified God because He had given authority, this authority, to men. They'd seen it. Jesus had been given this authority. So what did He have to be? Really, what He had to be was one of us. And let's see if we can explore that a bit in the Scriptures as well. In Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 14, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood. Who are the children being referred to? Who? Us, right? The people. <laughs> we. We are the children. <coughs> We're the ones who need help. We are the ones who God is trying to to, to, to reestablish fellowship with. He's trying to save us. He's trying to help us. We, the children, we are flesh and blood. We share flesh and blood. He himself, now we're speaking of Jesus specifically, Jesus himself shared the same things so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. Let me, this right here is the number one proof, the number one reason Jesus had to be one of us, and that is death. So really, when we say he had to be, we have to fill in that last blank. Jesus had to be blank. We have to fill that last blank in with someone or something that could do something that we can do. Die. God can't. God cannot die. The writer here says, Jesus had to be flesh and blood because He had to destroy the one who has the power of death, but there was a means by which He was going to do that that is unique to the human experience. Jesus was going to have to die. So when we fill in that last blank of what Jesus had to be, He could not have been God. This isn't a matter of a technicality. This is a matter of, this is what the Scriptures teach. What He had to be was someone who could, through death, destroy the devil who has the power over death. The power of death. He had to be. He had to be. Jesus had to be one of us. He simply had to be. Because He was going to have to die in order to purchase our salvation. Have you ever heard this before? Jesus had to purchase our salvation. Jesus had to pay what I could not pay. Have you ever heard that before? Right. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. We have nothing to offer. So this is what we've always said traditionally for years and years and years. What do we say about Jesus? What's different about Him? Oh, He, Jesus, paid it all, right? He could only pay it. He could only pay it. He could only pay it. That's right. That's exactly right. But the other conclusion that we always come to is that He had to be God in order to pay it. That's absolutely wrong. Right. Because if He had to be God to pay it, the paying is what? What was the price he paid? Death. God can't die. This doesn't work. This isn't a matter about, you know, blasting this tradition and that tradition. This is not about any of it. This simply does not work according to the Scriptures. What he had to be was one of us. 
And then you say, well, that's the same thing. You're saying that Kirk couldn't pay for you. I couldn't pay for him. Yes, but that's because I said Kirk has his own sins. I said I have my own sins. Now we begin to talk about Jesus. What if he has no sins? If he's human and has no sins, can he do this that this writer's talking about? Can he die? Yes. Did he? Yes, He did. That's the difference. So when God sees our Lord Jesus Christ coming, He doesn't see the robe on Him like my robe. Dirty and spotted and tattered and torn. When He sees Jesus coming, He sees one of us coming, but He sees Him clothed in a robe of pure white. And He says... Not as I will, but as you will. He says, I could pray my Father, and He'd send me legions of angels to get me out of this. Why? Because in terms of deserving it, He took that cross for me. He took that cross for you. Not because of His own sin, for He had none. But that still doesn't take away that one of us had to do what only one of us could do, die. Would you say this is probably, not probably, would you say that Jesus' sacrificial death for our atonement is the most important work that He ever accomplished? Would we not agree that His death on the cross is the greatest thing, and I'm not talking about happy, but I'm talking about in terms of importance. Is that not the greatest thing that he has ever done? And if he couldn't be God to do it, that greatest of all things, then I ask you in all sincerity, why would he have to be God to do anything else? If he could accomplish that, as one of us, why would He have to be God for anything else? Verse 17. Listen to this. I told you about the, that He had to be. Remember? I told you that I said He had to be God. The words He and had and to and be and God all appear in our English translations of the Bible. Do they not? Of course they do. Sure, of course they do. But they never occur in that order together. <laughs> but interestingly enough, look at what I did find. I found he had to and be. And then I found some interesting other words to go on the end of that. And look at what this says. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. That's what he had to be. And all of us preachers ought to be ashamed for not quoting the Bible correctly. He had to be made like his brothers in every way. I need to be standing up there and saying that. Anybody who wants to, to, who wants to preach and teach and, and, and give exhortation out of the Scriptures, when you come to your, he had to be, quote, this is the one you better use. He had to be made like His brothers in every way. That includes being the thing that He could not have been if He were God. And that is subject to death. He had to be made like His brothers in every way in order that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. We were talking about earlier about the example of Him being judge, Him placing His hand upon us and upon His Father and bringing us together. Notice this. This is that type of intercession. That's what a high priest is about. He's going to be a faithful and merciful high priest. What do you think this means? The in order to means... He had to have this in order to do this. I'm going to tell you something that's going to be revolutionary. Ah, he, Jesus could not have been a merciful and faithful high priest unless He was like His brothers in every way. 
Jesus could not have been the high priest that God wanted him to be unless he was like us in every way. And the same writer here will tell us, again, like us in every way. Oh, you're saying he's sinful. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. The writer said he was tempted in all points, just as we are yet, in his case, without sin. But this verse still stands. He had to be made like his brothers in every way. So that he could make atonement for the sins of the people. For there is one God. Amen. And one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Not the God Christ Jesus. Not the God man Christ Jesus. Not the angel man Christ Jesus. The man, Christ, Jesus. And for all of our traditions and our theological arguments, which, you know, praise the Lord, I hope, I hope it's evidence of my spirit here this morning. I have not endeavored to go into any such debate. Academic arguments and such. Forget all that. For anybody that has any question about that, we're talking about years after Jesus has died on the cross, he has raised from the dead. He has been taken up into heaven. He has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And right now, as Paul is writing these words in his real time, that's where he is. And Paul says, we have a mediator. And he's the man, Christ Jesus. Paul's not afraid to use that term. Neither should we be. If that doesn't work with our theology, it's our theology that needs to change. He's the man Christ Jesus. And we quote that verse a lot. It's an important verse, and it is, it is a powerful verse, wonderful verse. But also, in reviewing things and thinking about things this morning, I wanted us to add also what Paul says in verse 6. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And Paul's not through talking about the Lord. He's not through talking about Jesus. He says, Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And as we do close, I'll leave us with this. There is a testimony that the world needs to hear. There is a testimony, a report, that's not really being sounded out in the world today. And we deserve that testimony. And that testimony is this. The man, Christ Jesus, gave himself a ransom for all. The man, Christ Jesus, who hurt when they scourged him, who suffered when they crucified him, who feared, says the Bible, who cried, says the Bible. The man Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. One of us for all of us. It's time that testimony was proclaimed. They tell me I live on a spinning blue ball Off of which somehow I don't seem to fall If I'm flying through space at incredible pace Why don't I have to hold on? I think it's a lie, I can tell you just why The reasons are many and plain there's a ball off of which you don't fall I'm afraid you're quite clearly insane For thousands of years the same stars do appear In the very same place in the sky Were we hurling through space this could not be the case We would see a new sky every night When I stand on the shore I see many miles more Than I could should I stand on a ball we can see hours away, 100 miles only on a plane, can this be real? There 
There's no place called space, there was never a race And they never put men on the moon It's all made for TV just to fool you and me Should I buy it? I'm just a buffoon Satellite dishes are always suspicious They never point up to the sky They point to the side, radio towers high I'm sure it's just one of their lies As forgeries go, they set the bar low Just three photos of Earth that they claim Photoshop clouds shout the truth loud None of them look quite the same That they went to the moon, I believed it too soon Now it's clear they had something to hide You don't bring a car anywhere up that far Play golf and to take a joy ride The sun, moon and stars really aren't out that far They move round this flat disc once a day Place we call home is all under a dome Just like our forefathers did say no place called space, there was never a race And they never put men on the moon It's all made for TV just to fool you and me Should I buy it? I'm just a buffoon In the great void of space A rocket can go any place It was sit there and spin with no distance to win The idea is absurd, it's all fake called space there was never a race and they never put men on the moon it's all made for tv just to fool you and me should i buy it i'm just a buffoon You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Have you heard of the promise contained in the name of Yahweh? If you haven't, you're not alone. Satan has done his utmost to conceal this powerful truth from human minds. He knows the power of the promise contained in the name of Yah. He knows that this knowledge, combined with the power inherent in the divine name, will unlock all the treasures of heaven. The most powerful promise in the entire universe is known to only a handful of people. But heaven is just waiting to bless everyone who will call upon the promise in Yah's name. Learn how you can too. Go to worldslastchance.com and click on the WLC radio icon. Look for the episode entitled The Most Powerful Promise in the Universe. You can also listen to it on YouTube. Time for our Delhi mailbag. Maggie Donnelly from Dundalk, Ireland, has a question for us. Now, did you know, here's a fact for you, did oh. you know Ireland is home to one of the oldest lighthouses in the world? Really? Yes. Now, Ooh. Spain has the oldest operating lighthouse in the world, but Ireland has the second oldest. It was built in 1172. Wow. And is still being used today. You know, you really should write that book of, what was it called now? Dad's Totally Fascinating, Utterly Useless Facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's more fun collecting them than writing about them, actually. Yeah, uh, very anyway, well sorry, we're off the point. What does Maggie have to say to us today? Well, she's got a question that I think more and more believers, particularly in the West, will be encountering in the future, and it has to do with witchcraft. Oh, there's been a growing number of people in the West actually returning to the ancient pagan traditions or what they think that they were. Yeah. In Eastern countries where there have always been heathen religions, believers encounter this on, on an ongoing basis, actually. But you're absolutely right. It is growing in the West. It sure is right now. My sister is extremely upset, she writes, because her daughter recently revealed she's a witch. Is there still hope for my niece or has she committed the unpardonable sin? My sister 
has cut off all contact with her daughter and insists the rest of the family do the same. I'm very close to my niece and refuse to do it. So now my sister is mad at me. I don't know how to handle the whole situation. So I'm asking, what would Jesus do? Hmm. This sounds like a situation where everyone's emotions are at boiling point. Totally, totally. Well, let me say right off that I do agree with you, Maggie, that the last thing you want to do is to cut off all contact with your niece. Think about it. What's the strongest power in the universe? Easy. Love. The love of Yah. Right. And if you completely withdraw from the person you're trying to draw to Yah, you're not going to get very far. (laughs) That's true. That's true. We all need to remember that, definitely. And I've noticed that a lot of believers feel extremely uncomfortable around people who self-identify as witches or pagans. Neo-pagans. Well, yes, whatever they call themselves, Christians tend to fear them and, and back away. Now, this is unfortunate because, again, how are we to draw them to the truth if we back away and have nothing to do with them? Yeah, I, I think you're right there. It's, it's, it's fear-based, isn't it? You know, people hear witch and assume devil worshipper and can't get away from from them fast enough. Which is unfortunate. Most are very live and let live individuals. Furthermore, if being in the very presence of a witch were that dangerous, missionaries would never be sent to heathen lands. Remember, Satan is a defeated foe. You don't need to be afraid of a defeated foe. Furthermore, a number of Bible scholars make a sound linguistic argument that the original word referred to poisoners and not what we think of as witches at all. Poisoners? As in someone who poisons someone else? Yeah, way back when, poison was a popular and effective way of killing someone. Interesting, yeah, I'll give you that. So so getting back to Maggie's question then, what would Yahushua do in a situation like this? Yahushua, of course, would love. It's that simple and that profound. In Luke chapter 8, verse 2, we learn that Yahushua had cast seven evil spirits out of Mary Magdalene. That means he didn't cut Mary Magdalene out of his life. He didn't withdraw from her. He didn't cut her out of his life. He helped her. Yeah, and I can see that. And we we know uh, from both Luke 7, 34 and Matthew 11, verse 19, from Christ's own words, that his enemies frequently denounced him precisely because he was a friend of sinners. So what should Maggie do? The same thing Yahushua did, talk to her. Ask polite, interested questions. Listen to her when she talks to you. Invite her to your house for a meal. Accept the invitation when she invites you to her house. Be a friend. This doesn't mean the niece is lost. Don't let fear keep you away from someone Yahushua is trying to draw to himself. You do that, Satan wins. Simple as that. Yes. The thing we must always remember is that sinners were drawn to the Saviour because he treated them with kindness and courtesy. He was a friend to them. So they were his friends. He loved them. Love draws. Disapproval repels. Always. If you want to draw someone to Yah, you will draw them with love because that's how Yahushua did it. Yeah, it's really the only thing that works, isn't it? Uh, All right, got time for another question, actually. Uh, Next question is for Sanju in Tongi. It's Bangladesh. And he says, Dear Miles and Dave, based on your experience, what sin would you say Christians of the last generation need to be most careful in guarding against? Hmm... That's an interesting question there, Sanju. Thank you. It is. Yeah, thanks for that question. Now, I would say that categorically, the sins Christians need to guard against the most are sins of the mind. What, like porn? Seems like porn addiction has just exploded quite recently, isn't it? The internet has made it so easy to... uh to achieve well yes i mean porn certainly comes under that category of sins of the mind however there's another that is even more dangerous and that is self-deceit are we deceiving ourselves okay i'm not quite with you on this one okay let me explain self-deceit can be as straightforward as stubbornly refusing to consider any new ideas that contradict what you already believe This happens when a people insist that they already have all truth and their beliefs are without error. Yeah, I've I've run into that attitude before, to be honest, and they get angry at you, don't they, and won't even consider the possibility that they might have made a mistake. Mm. They just reject it without studying it out. Self-deceit, though, can be as subtle as twisting scripture to fit what we want it to mean. The subtle mind games we play to justify doing what we want to do can be extremely difficult to discern, but we need to be aware of this. 
How many people believe based on what's convenient, and yet we never analyse our beliefs that way? Mm, I've, I've never thought of it that way before, but you're right. You are right. Dan. Could you just read Matthew sixteen twenty four for us? Here, Yahushua is explaining a reality of the Christian experience that we tend to gloss over. But if we're truly living according to Yah's will for our lives, it will very much be a reality we have to deal with. Well, it says, Then Yahushua said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you are truly following Christ, you will be carrying a cross too, the cross of obedience. That's what he meant by saying he must deny himself. If you're not denying self daily, if you're not carrying that cross of obedience, then you need to ask yourself what is off in your Christian walk. Yeah, okay. Well, that was going to be my next question, actually. How can we truly know if we are living in conformity to the will of Yah? And how can we know if we're deceiving ourselves? Well, there are three questions each one of us needs to prayerfully ask ourselves. Firstly, do I believe that the Bible is the word of Yah and I am to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah? Or do I view it as a sort of spiritual metaphor and I can sort of pick and choose what suits me? Well, you answer that honestly, that will really cut deeply, won't it? Yeah. The second question will too. Ask yourself, if I do believe the Bible is Yah's word, am I truly living my life by its precepts? Am I obeying it to the best of my understanding and ability and the strength Yahushua gives me? And finally, ask yourself, if I'm not, why not? To close, would you read Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 to 19? Yeah, sure. That's the message to the Laodiceans, the last generation church. Indeed. It says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. There is hope in Yahushua, even for those who are self-deceived. Listen, if you are deceived, you're not going to know it. You can't. You're deceived. But what you can do is simply pray and say, your word says that I am blind and deceived. I can't see it, but then I'm blind. I will accept by faith that your assessment of me is true. Please forgive my sin and arrogance. Please give me your gold, tried in the fire. Cover me with the garments of your righteousness and apply your eye salve to my eyes. Yahweh is the answer for everything, even self-deception. So don't wait. Ask him to reveal yourself to you today and ask that he give you a heart willing to obey every truth he reveals to you. Yah is always the answer. Whatever you need, whatever help, guidance, anything, he's the answer. If you've got a question, just send it in. Go to worldslastchance.com, click on the contact us section and that's it. Simple as that. We look forward to hearing from you. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 to 17 contains a promise for those who struggle with failing health. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Constant struggles without respite can be discouraging, but chronic health issues are even worse. Even in such situations, Yahweh has the power to strengthen and sustain. 
In the early spring of 1905, Walter and Sevilla Martin were travelling through the state of New York in the United States. They met and became good friends with a couple named the Doolittles. Mrs Doolittle had been bedridden for a good 20 years. Mr Doolittle was crippled and had to use a wheelchair to get to his business. Despite their serious health problems, though, the Doolittles were joy-filled Christians who encouraged and inspired everyone they knew. One day, while the Martins were visiting with their new friends, Dr Martin asked them the secret of their consistently bright and cheerful outlook. Mrs Doolittle replied simply, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Dr and Mrs Martin were so inspired by the boundless faith of this one simple statement, Mrs Martin went home and, writing from the heart, immediately turned it into a poem. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The next day Mrs Martin mailed her poem to Charles Gabriel, who set it to music. It has become one of the best-known gospel songs ever written, encouraging faith in multitudes. In Matthew chapter 10, Yehushua asked, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. No matter what happens in your life, you can be assured that the Father is still in control and He will remain right by your side throughout all of it. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." 
For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, He declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to him. If you're enjoying WLC Radio, invite your friends to listen in too. If you know someone interested in last day events or you have a Bible study partner, tell them about our website, worldslastchance.com. have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.